Well, welcome to this program of Real Life Today, and we're going to be getting into our Bibles together, as is our custom. And today we're going to be looking at uh, a very challenging portion of Scripture, one, if we're honest, convicts every single one of us. And that is regarding the parables of Jesus. We're continuing on from time to time in this series of teachings. And today we're looking at the parable of the two gates, the two ways that Jesus warns us about in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7. And uh, I got to tell you that it seems to be human nature to say something to the effect, all roads lead to God. Now look, on the common surface, it's easy to say, all roads lead to God. It makes people feel good. It's, uh, it it, it kind of takes the edges off of accountability, eternity, judgment, all roads lead to God. I could argue though, theologically, it is true, all roads lead to God, meaning everyone must stand before God at the end, and then your destination is determined according to Jesus. So yeah, maybe all roads do lead to God, but the question is, will you, after appearing before God, remain in heaven? That's the difference. Listen, Gandhi said something and I want to read it to you, Gandhi. He said, quote, religions are different roads converging upon the same point. What does it matter that we take different roads so long as we reach the same goal? Close quote by Gandhi. Gandhi is repeating something that is grossly inaccurate, goes against the very words of Jesus, but makes the soul feel good if we don't have a heaven or a hell in the end. The truth is, friend, there is a heaven and there is a hell. And Jesus is going to be giving us great teachings on how to avoid being ejected off of that narrow path onto the broad path. Look, you're going to be hearing Jesus say that narrow is the path, narrow is the road that leads to eternal life. There's few people who find that but broad, grand, well-traveled. Many people are on the path that leads to destruction. And so as we go through this study together, you need to judge yourself as to what path are you on? Where are you? So listen, grab your Bibles, Matthew 7. Let's get into the two gates, the two ways taught by Jesus in the parables. by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Leave it on the screen for a moment. Church, look at this. Many, we'll, we'll learn more about this tonight, many. Many go in by the destructive path. Many. You're going to be shocked at the actual meaning of that word, many. And then Jesus ends verse 14 by saying, only a few make it in. Only a few. Now, first of all, in the context of what Jesus is saying, he's speaking of the grandeur of all humanity from start to finish, from Adam to the last human being. And all of the billions and billions of people who would have been born and died in that parenthesis of humanity, Jesus says only a fraction make it to heaven. But don't think for a moment that God is the one keeping them out of heaven, those who don't make it. Don't think that. No, no, no. It's amazing tonight because Jesus, listen everybody, this may slam right upside some of your theology based upon how you were raised in a certain denomination or a certain way of thinking. Jesus is laying down at the end of the Sermon on the Mount a decision or a choice for every human to make. You choose, he's saying, between two gates or two ways. The choice is yours. And he's saying, in a nutshell, unfortunately, most people choose 
the broad, huge, massive path that leads to destruction, and very few people choose the narrow, straight gate and way. Immediately, Jesus puts the responsibility for rejecting his offer upon those who do, in fact, reject him. But for those of us who have chosen Christ, we don't pat ourselves on the back that we chose him. No, we give him all the glory because he provided the way of salvation. It's not our doing. For salvation, the Bible says, is of the Lord. And so while on earth, Jesus in his 33-year ministry, technically, in the three and a half years of his public work, Jesus, in my opinion, I made up this term, and, and I'll have to explain it to you, but Jesus practiced what I call negative church growth methods. That is negative church growth methods. You say, what do you mean by that? Um, First of all, Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. Can you mark that down? Jesus said, my sheep. Does, church, does he know who his sheep are? Yes. My sheep hear my voice. That's an awesome statement. So the question is, have you heard his voice? I know them, and they follow me. Look at it carefully. My sheep can hear my voice, Jesus says. I know who they are. And oh, by the way, every time, so to speak, Jesus looks over his shoulder and he sees behind him, what? His sheep. What are they doing? They're following him. Listen, don't answer out loud. Are you following Jesus? Is this the biggest heartbeat passion of your soul is to follow Christ, is to draw closer to Jesus? Listen, if your answer tonight is, yes, that's what I live for. I mean, I may be an engineer, or I may be a pilot, or I may be a housewife, or a house dad, or a whatever. I, but my number one passion is to draw closer to Jesus. You know why that's true? It's true because you've heard his voice. I always find it amazingly comforting and yet also convicting as we ponder these paths. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, they follow me. He went on to say that those that are his sheep, they won't follow a strange voice. What does that mean? Jesus speaks doctrine. Jesus is the word of God. When Jesus speaks, it is the word of God speaking. The Bible is the record of the words of God. From Genesis to Revelation, it's God's account of all that we need to know God at this time in this world for this moment until we see him face to face. He's provided everything. But the awesome word is Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. There's a, a, an awesome divine assumption in that. He states it as a matter of fact. Those who are mine hear my voice. And oh, by the way, those who are not mine, they listen to other voices. False doctrine, wrong teaching. You ever wondered about that? How is it that some you know and yourself, I pray, you're on the straight and narrow and you've got friends and you've got people that you've bumped into, maybe even some of them are at church, and they just gravitate to strange doctrines. They gravitate to strange voices. Wow. This is a critical thing that we must apply. Let's continue on understanding we better be very, very careful how we hear what's being said. All right, let's move on. He knows you because you're one of his sheep. Well, what, am I, what if I'm a goat? A goat doesn't ever ask if it's a goat. A goat could care less about anything except self. And goats eat junk. Have you noticed a goat will eat a filet mignon and they'll eat a tin can in the same moment. Sheep, listen, sheep have to have a shepherd. Sheep are very, very incredibly stupid. They'll walk right into a river to get a drink of water and go right down the river. <laughs> Did you know that? Sheep have to have a shepherd. Goats, they'll run around, they'll climb mountains. They, they're just rebellious stinkers. Uh, but, but a sheep, sheep have got to have a shepherd. 
And um, it's amazing. It's just absolutely amazing. But you are one of his sheep if you've heard his voice. And if you've heard his voice, and if you're his, and he knows you and you know him, there's no greater passion to the beat of your soul than to get near and closer to Jesus. And tonight I say that because you need to be thinking about where is Jesus on your scale of priorities? Because a Christian, Jesus doesn't even appear on the scale. Jesus, we would coin a modern phrase as off the charts. Jesus is not on a priority sheet because there's no priority sheet that can contain Jesus. He's not number one on a list of 10. He's one on a list of one. He has no rival in your soul. Do you understand? And this is important. Think of the rich young ruler. What are some of these negative growth tactics? Remember the rich young ruler? He came to Jesus. And you know the story, but he listed, good master, what, I must, what must I do to be saved? I've kept all these things since my youth. Jesus didn't dispute that, by the way. Jesus wound up telling him, why don't you sell everything that you have and come and follow me? Now, that's not how you get saved, is it? You don't get saved by selling everything you have. What is Jesus doing? Jesus, listen, please listen. Jesus, here's a man that any church would have bent over backwards to get into their tithing ranks. A rich, young, yuppie, ruler. (laughs) And Jesus said, here's the deal. Sell everything you have and come and follow me. And the Bible says the man was absolutely grieved over that because he had great possessions and he was very sad. And the man walked away very, very sorrowful. And by the way, the Bible says Jesus was sad too. You know what a church, you know what a church would have done? Dude, what do you want? I mean, you want to sit up front? You want your name on the seat? You want to have a parking spot out there for you? Wait, we want you at our church, man. No, no, Jesus said, you know what? I know exactly what's wrong with your heart. You've kept all this stuff, but here's the problem. You have tons of idols in your life. You love your stuff. And why don't you get rid of it all and follow God? Again, that's not how you get saved, but Jesus strikes him in the heart of where his treasures were at, right? Jesus practiced negative church growth methods. The guy wound, turned around and walked away. The next one is the blind men on the road. The Bible says that they were crying out for a healing and Jesus walked right by them as if he didn't see them or hear them. Was he aware of them? Absolutely he was aware of them. But they cried out and said, Son of David, have mercy. And that got him. That's a messianic call. Son of David, have mercy on us. Boom, that stopped them. And Jesus called for them. The other thing is this. Do you remember when the man came to Jesus and said, Jesus, I'm going to follow you, just I need to go bury my father. And the Bible says Jesus responded by saying, let the dead bury the dead. You say, well, that's a cold-hearted statement. Yeah, it's not what you think. The man's father was not dead. He was not even dying. The statement means, Jesus, I will come and follow you when it's convenient for me. I'm still under my parental authority and... I'm still insured by their health care plan uh, in my old age. And so I've got to wait until they kick the bucket and at a more convenient time, I'll follow you. And Jesus said, you know what? That is the logic of a dead world. You just, you just go on your way. What is he saying? He's saying that you need to really decide if you want to have a spiritual life and live for God. I'm all for decisions for Christ. We do this here, but I've never begged people to do it based on this very thing. You know, if you want to accept Jesus Christ, you know, raise your hand or stand up or come forward or whatever I'm feeling led by God to say or whatever I'm thinking is like whatever you stand up. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But if you, if you choose Christ, if you decide on Christ, don't ever put stock in the fact that you went forward. Dude, I got saved. What happened? I went forward. That's not how you get saved. Well, I raised my hand. You don't get saved by raising your hand. There's something that's supposed to happen before all that stuff happens later. It's supposed to be an absolute change of heart and mind, and we'll see this in a moment. But this is critically important. I got to tell you, um, 
this is a very, very necessary parable that we need to look at today in our culture. Point number one, it's this. The parable of the two gates and the two ways, verse 13 is this. Number one is make sure you're on the right path. I mean, this kind of sounds redundant, but let's not race across this and make a mistake tonight. God help us if we get through with this message and you have not been brought to that place of decision. You need to be brought to the place of decision. And even us who are Christians tonight need to be reminded of the decision that we've made. And we need to ask the question, would we make it again? Think of that. Have you ever heard, have you ever heard married couples after they, you know, they've been married for a while? Um, would, you, would you marry me again? I mean, that's a, that's a low, what are you asking that question for? Don't ask that question. Because even if you say yes, I mean, the risk factor is huge on that one. Because even if you mean it, it could come across with a different tone. You could burp halfway through it. It's like, oh, yes, of course I, what is that? You hesitated. <laughs> would you just, would you, listen, tonight, isn't it, true for, isn't it true for all of us as Christians that we would, we would choose Jesus again? Again and again and again. Now, we don't need to do that regarding salvation. But do we not get up every morning and choose Jesus again in obedience? So make sure you're on the right path. Verse 13, this way. Number one, keep your eyes on heaven. Oh, church, listen. Keep your eyes on heaven, not on the earth and not on the things of the earth. Keep your eyes on heaven. Matthew 7, 13, enter by the narrow gate. Mark it. Mark that down. This is absolutely an awesome mandate, a command of Jesus. Jesus says, listen, enter by the narrow gate. It's a command. Christians, listen, because there's, as we mentioned on Sunday, we need to say it again. There's a Jesus being painted out there by, the, by a, a religious community. Their Jesus doesn't say this kind of stuff. This Jesus of the Bible says, enter by the narrow gate. Narrow gate, enter. First of all, enter. He's telling us, enter. See, we want him to get us through the gates. And look, he will do that if we keep our eyes fixed on him. He does it, watch this. Listen, are you listening? He does all the work, but then he turns to us and says, because I've done it all, you walk now in my footsteps, so to speak, right? You walk, I'm going ahead of you, but you walk in my steps, if we wander outside of his steps, you're in uncharted waters. Do you understand that? You're going to get hurt. If, if I had an umbrella, and you know, we had a big rainstorm today, right? It rained 100 thousandths of an inch, I think, in, in Chino Hills today. Uh, whew, good thing winter's over. Um, but if, if you would have had an umbrella, you would not have gotten wet. If you would have moved out from the covering of the umbrella, what's going to happen? You're going to get, not, you won't get wet here, you'll get damp. You'll get damp here. But right, you move out from his covering. Jesus says, enter by the narrow gate. The cool thing is, we'll see in our following studies, that he is the way, he is the gate, he is the door, he is the entire journey. Stay focused on heaven. We just saw a ridiculous, embarrassing debacle by a so-called Christian organization who decided that the voice of a community was louder and more authoritative than the revealed word of God. They made a decision, and they took their eyes off of heaven. And you say, well, that's, that's terrible for that organization. Wait a minute. Husbands and fathers do this in families. Wives and moms do this in homes. If we get our eyes off of Jesus, Jesus says, listen, to the Christian, he says, I'm summing up the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever delivered. Everybody loves the Sermon on the Mount. Even, even non-believers love the Sermon on the Mount. Seriously, Hallmark loves the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the pure in heart. That's in the Sermon on the Mount. A city that is set on a hill. That's on the Sermon on the Mount. 
be salt and light, Sermon on the Mount. The golden rule, you ever heard of that? Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus says, I'll sum it up. Everything I just got done talking about in three chapters, here it is, enter in by the narrow gate. Wow. And so, listen, the Holy Spirit says to me, Jack, enter in by the narrow gate. And you think of that for him. Think about that for you. There are only two paths according to Jesus. Oh, this is, listen, this is so politically incorrect. Jesus says there's only two roads. So listen, you can hear the gravity of that. There is, there, there is two paths. There are two ways. One leads to destruction. One leads to hell. One leads to peril. And one leads to the face of God. One leads to the paradise of God. One leads to the dwelling of God. And I know that it's human nature to say, Jack, you know what? That's just so narrow. That is just so rude. I can't believe you're saying that. Well, first of all, listen, I'm not saying it. I'm just repeating what is truth here. I'm not making this up. I'm just giving you what God has said. But stop for a moment. Divorce yourself from the emotions. Isn't it true in life, period? How do I get to your house? How do you get to my house? There may be other ways seemingly early on, but eventually there's only one way, right? You know what, your GPS might say, you can go this way or you can go that way, you can click this option and that option, this will be a little shorter, this one's gonna be a little bit more direct. It's, listen, it's regardless of the fact that eventually to get to my house, you've got to come one way. So maybe you are going through life and you are now thinking, well, I think I'm a good person, I'm a nice guy. You know what, I'm not as bad as my neighbor. You know, I think I'm doing all right. You're on the broad path. Right now you have the luxury of exercising options. You're healthy, you're breathing. It's not a crisis for you yet. But listen, the closer you get to the target or the closer the plane gets to the runway to land, Everything that is broad goes away, and everything that becomes exact and precise can save a life. Thank God, after traveling 11,000 miles in an airplane, that pilot lands that behemoth on a 5,000 foot long piece of asphalt. That's narrow, friends. It's got to be narrow because Jesus Christ only came once to die for our sins. He rose again from the dead only once. And Jesus said that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me. That's narrow. It has to be narrow. Narrow is good. Narrow is safe. Narrow is comforting. The question is, are you on the narrow? And that's something that you need to judge yourself against the Word of God. Are you living for Christ? Is He the Lord of your life? You can make Him the Lord of your life by simply asking Him in, to your life, to forgive you of your sins, to accept Him as Lord and Savior. You and I are the sinners. He is the Savior. And that by His resurrection from the dead, you and I have been guaranteed eternal life. Call out to Him. Cry out to Him. He said, I will never turn anyone away who calls out to me. You do that right where you're at. And if you're doing that right where you're at, we would love to hear from you. You can contact me at reallifewithjackhibbs.org reallifewithjackhibbs.org and let us know about this decision that you've made to follow Jesus Christ. God bless you until next time.